news. Um, I'm the former uh, provost of the Army University, and in my last job, I was in Cadet Command, or I was the commander of Cadet Command. And about the last 15 years of my career was all about human development. And so having been in retirement now for four years, that has been my quest is to actually try to get that done before I die. Um, so but as I saw in Mr. Dr. Hogue's brief today, that will probably not happen. Um, could we have the next slide, please? Actually, we skip through the next three. Or well, we, I'm sorry, one the first one's good. There we go. These, these are the objectives that we've laid out um, for this session. And it, we really want to talk a little bit about how AI can predict and develop talent. Now, Rick Killian, you asked a question, Rick, about how AI could be used in the recruiting of faculty, um, kind of enterprise looking down. Um, we're going to talk today largely about from the individual looking up. Um, so it's it's kind of a different approach than what we saw yesterday. Because, uh, you know, our, our CEO likes to talk about, let's see if I can get this back up here. He's got a quote he likes to use that says, you know, what the learner or the Army officer, whoever, says, do I have the necessary skills to succeed in this role? Okay, and then if not, what can I do about it? And that's that's a lot of what we're talking about today, is how you can use AI to help people prepare for those jobs that that they want and that the Army needs them to have and be successful in. Uh, if you could skip the next three slides, those are just bios that we uh, put in there so people know who's talking to them. Go again. And again, and again. One more. All right, so just to give you an idea who Astrum is. Do you want to talk about this one? Sure. So Astrum U was founded with the principle of how can we level the playing field and uh, do that at a micro level. And what I mean by that is looking at the learner and then developing an understanding of the learners verified skills to help them define a pathway to success. Uh, and over that time, we've actually built up uh, something in the region of 1.1 million potential learners that we've verified. And we're looking to kind of continually hone and understand uh, how to build a engaged learner around their uh, opportunity for economic advancement. The, uh, today, we're in about 30 universities who are using our tool primarily to help uh, recruit learners into their graduate programs. But because of our model, which we'll go into a little bit more detail, you'll see how we can actually expand that beyond just the universities and uh, academic programs into actually workforce development as well. Can I jump on Jim? Yep. So in the, uh, the scheme of things, uh, after retirement and um, having spent a lot of time trying to figure out personnel requirements, the Army personnel plan or strategy, um, and sitting on 13 boards at uh, Fort Knox, Kentucky when I was a senior commander. That's a lot of boards to sit on, it's a lot of records to review, it's a lot of selection of talent based upon, in my personal opinion, your own personal biases, okay? Uh, the, the flaw of the human in the selection process is evident. We all know it intuitively, but we can't prove it. Um, but I also saw a lot of goodness in that process with the human in the process, in the, in the evolution of how you select the right people to do the right things, schools, jobs, command, uh, whatever it might be. But the other aspect of it is knowing what the Army is actually looking for. That was always the great puzzle. General Milley, when he was a chief, would tell me to go out to 986 college universities and find agile, adaptive, and innovative college students to make second lieutenants in the United States Army. And I would have spirited conversations with him about how in the hell do you go up to a 17-year-old kid, what tests do I apply to see if they're innovative, ad agile, and adaptive, and innovative? You know, do I push them out a window and see how they respond? I don't know how you do that, sir. I said, do you want all three of those before commissioning? Do you want one of those before commissioning and 50% on this one and 25? What, how do, what do we really want? And so that was always the interesting thing, was to sit on a board and look at board instructions 
they had everybody's opinion in there about what we should pick and why. You know, when somebody's supposed to read 800 pages of board instructions, have that memorized, and then look at 2,400 files and pick the right people, clearly we have a we have a challenge with data, we have a challenge with culture, we have a challenge of understanding what right looks like, and we have a challenge of that always evolving over time, as we saw in the previous brief. And so that's why Jim and I and, and others who used to serve are very attracted to the idea of using big data either in a before, a during, or an after of a soldier's life cycle. And what we have found is it's as much as important for him, even though he's got these college students in his database and he's able to call and parse information about them, it's making sure the employers know what the heck they're looking for and we, we, we inject, ingest their information as well and help those CEOs better see themselves as to what they're actually looking for because sometimes they're stuck in what worked when they first did the business up in their organization as to what it's evolved to in its operational design, which is out of sync with this organizational design. So we help them, this is what you're actually looking for. And by the way, we then can connect you one for one with a high degree of probability of success using artificial intelligence, and then put it back in the human link to make sure we got the culture and everything else correctly. That is what we've been trying to do in the Army since Dr. Hogan and I were you know, second lieutenants. Okay, it's evolved over time, but it still has the same institutional flaws. And so in his line of effort, two, one, he actually said, what are those technologies? So the question has always been, who's responsible for that? How is the authority aligned? Are the resources actually applied against this? Or is this just an exercise of academic, you know, kabuki dance? And that's what I'd like you to take away from Is this an academic kabuki dance that we're all here talking about something that has no authority and no funding and has no proponency within the department and has multiple heads? And so that is the question that uh, I'd like you to take away from the conference just from me personally, because I've been trying to solve it for 39 years and I'm not even close. Sorry, Jim. I'll get off my okay. soapbox. Anything, you want anything else on that slide, Kai? No. Next slide, please. And then, uh, so talking a little bit about Astromuse services, and I, uh, again, we have, uh, as I mentioned earlier in my introduction about myself, we have essentially two core areas of activity. One is our platform uh, for AI, which is the scalable solution that we have for ingesting, organizing, and presenting the data. And then we have a translation engine as a service capability, which is uh, is a architecture of uh, essentially loosely based components that enable us to connect with our solutions today. One of them is skill set. And skill set is a way for us to identify what skills you have and then use that to determine what skills you need so that we can close that skills bridge uh, and support your, uh, your, your choices in terms of what path you want to take. And then ReadySet is the enrollment tool that we use for universities where we can help learners make a decision based on what their skills are today uh, uh, and decide which program they want to pursue in, in, in support of their goal. In this case, it could be the job, it could be uh, the location they want to work in, et cetera. And so we're able to use that as a way of helping them bridge that understanding so they can make the right choice for their education pathway. Next slide, please. So yesterday, General Martin talked about BCAP. And um, I've been around the Army a little while longer than Chris. Um, you know, I haven't come in in 75. And I don't know how many different OERs I saw. And, and BCAP was, you know, a, a, a massive change in how we get after battalion command. But I watched the first couple of BCAPs and I watched Lieutenant Colonels leave here going, what do they want? What's it going to be? And then I watched us take those assessments that are in BCAP and move them down here to the staff college. And John Martin talked yesterday about, you know, kind of the captain's career course. Well, my question is, when I saw that and I started spending time around the data scientists at Astro U, was, you know, this is actually a perfect analogy for what talent management, not from the top down, from the bottom up, could do. If, 
if we know what it is, the skills we want at VCAP, all right, then if we measure where an officer is in those skills, let's say at pre-commissioning, not even wait until Bowie. AI can be used to build a personalized path to improve that officer. All right, so that officer can, can get a personalized path and maybe by the time they're a captain, they go, you know what, I am not gonna, I don't wanna do these things. So now you could have a personalized path towards a strategist or a personalized path towards acquisition. AI gives you that ability if you know what the skills are at the far end. All right, and you know the skills you have, okay, we can fill the gap and say, hey, this particular credential would put you a certain percentage closer to being successful in that job. All right, so now an officer, instead of, you know, talking to their assignments officer, and I haven't dealt with an assignments officer in a long time, and it used to be they had a lot of officers and not a lot of assignment officers. So there wasn't a lot of mentoring going there. And mentoring has been a mentoring coaching has been a problem in the army since, since I was a second lieutenant, because we just don't have time. This is a way of providing unbiased mentoring based on validated data. Okay. That can help an officer make decisions as they go along the way. Chris and I have talked about the same thing for cadets about what branch they want to be in and therefore, what should I do en route to it? So I just wanted to point this one out as a, as a potential case study, where if we took an, a, a cadet at pre-commissioning or we took a second lieutenant, gave them the exact same assessments that we will give at BCAP. And now they can start preparing themselves using this personalized pathway, all right, to be better at BCAP or to decide that's not what they want to do and see what other path they want to take in the Army. Um, rather than, I, it, it's been my belief that we've kind of stumbled through that a little bit, okay, over the last five, 10 years. Chris, anything you want to add to that? I'd add one thing, and, and what, you know, I saw this my entire career, is there was always the, amb the ambiguity of what was next, and to figure out what was next on your timeline to be successful if you wanted to continue in the Army, whatever branch you were in. And so you had to go get the barracks lawyers to tell you their opinion. You had to find the peers who knew no more than you did. And if you were lucky, you had a mentor who told you this was the pathway they used, but it was outdated. So the question would be is what can you do today to provide a current pathway and then have the analytics and the tool to tell you your, your degree of success in these three jobs if you pursue those particular pathways based upon your aggressiveness to be able to self-develop. Um, you could choose the easiest path and just kind of glide along, but where the number one complaint I used to get here in meetings, whether it was during the classroom or if it was at rocks in the evenings with other groups of people, different groups I met with, it was always the realization when they got here that there were certain constraints on their branch that they were not aware of until they entered this schoolhouse and started talking to professors. So all of a sudden they met reality and they would line up outside my door to leave the army because we surprised them because we weren't managing the talent. They had ambiguity the whole first seven to eight years of their career and suddenly were caught in the middle of their career realizing that their goals that they thought they were shooting for were unattainable based on the systems and the processes and the types of branches we have in the army. What I saw these guys doing with higher ed is scraping away the ambiguity of a college student who suddenly gets a very laid out career path of what to do at the college in order to get a job that they're interested in. It showed them how long it was going to take. It showed them what they're going to do. And it showed them their percentage of possible success in that particular job. So it gave them immediate return on investment and in staying on that career path. And, and I just want to, Jim, point out there's a yeah. question is there a question uh, Mike Holt distributed learning I'm I'm struggling uh, in a couple areas but I'll just talk about this one so what is the the level of success in the accuracy 
uh, or the predictability of the AI used that you're talking about, how, how accurate, you know, what, what, what is the, yeah. I mean, can you talk about that? Can you talk to that? Um, so I, off I could say, no, no, I think that's a good question because we, you know, outcomes are always what's key. And ultimately what we see and the goal that we've set for ourselves is that we can get to 80% plus in terms of predictive insights. Where we are today is, uh, uh, and in particular with the enrollment model that we've taken with the universities, uh, is that we're able to translate that into people actually selecting the program of the university uh, with a high degree of, um, of value to the university. So if you think about uh, the funnel when people are coming in and they're looking at the opportunity, today I think our, uh, our, our hit rate is uh, we're actually able to translate uh, in it's sort of around 8 to 10 percent of that original funnel into people who select the program and decide they're going to study at that university. So that's an actually a very high hit rate for uh, driving um, conversions and enabling somebody to make the right choice for the program that's going to help them advance based on them having the choice. And so we know that if you can actually, at an individual level, build a profile of that learner and you can give them an understanding of where their skills are today, uh, the chances are that we can then use that against our normalized data set on the job side we can actually show them how they would match or, or even predict success based on our understanding of the roles and where they are and what the gap is, we can get to that 80% outcome. And we can use that model to support hiring, optimizing your workforce uh, with the goal of retaining them uh, and also in terms of reskilling and uh, you know, ultimately retraining some of that workforce with last mile training. So my follow-up to that, because I'm always thinking, uh, what about using the AI in predicting the success in the classroom in teaching in the same way that the outcomes you're talking about with career path progression and workforce development, success and uh, in, in delivery of information so that as a, as a pre- uh, before before they yep. get out in the workers, right? So, hey, we're predicting the level, the success in the classroom as we deliver information. We're also now, based on that, we can predict your level of success in the workforce and so on. So yeah, I'm, no, that's a great question again. So we look at, so if you think about AstroMU, we look at the marketplace as having three sides. There's the, uh, there's the educational side, um, and then there's the uh, workforce development side, and then find or the enterprise side, and then there's the learner. We anchor everything on the learner, and we and we normalize the other two sides of the marketplace so that within our feature space, which is where the modeling is done, we can actually go the other way. We can look at a learner's uh, educational track record, and there's there's a whole bunch of information and signals that we can pick up on that longitudinal journey about. You know, uh, we can talk about hard skills for sure because you've got assessments and so on, but there's some weighting that you have to do there because, uh, you know, some schools mark differently versus others. So there's some modeling that happens there. But there's also soft skills you can pick up. And some of those soft skills actually can be picked up by looking at an individual who's worked in a project team. And if they've worked in a project team, you know that they're going to have some collaborative skills. You know they're going to have some uh, communication skills and that there's some uh, element of the syllabus that's going to tell you that and you use that over time if they're doing that on a consistent basis and they're getting scored well because of their ability to collaborate lead or communicate those are soft skill signals that we can use to again predict success now uh, our, our, our speaker earlier today spoke about this idea of how do you experiment and data science is a experiment it's a constant experiment Data is dirty. That is, that is the, uh, uh, the reality of our world today. It is getting cleaner, and with models like ours, we can actually improve on how we capture that data. Uh, the, the only thing I ask my team to do is if we break it, fix it cheerfully, um, because ultimately we're learning all the time, and we can improve on those signals. And the more data we can capture uh, and the more that we can sort of understand where those signals come from over that longitudinal journey across large base of learners, the cleaner and the more effective our predictive models become. Pete. Go ahead, sir. So, uh, 
So over at the Cyber Center of Excellence, we have the career uh, a louder, sir. we have the career cognitive assessment battery that we give to the captain's career course that also helps to predict who would be more successful at those field grade levels. Uh, unfortunately, when when it's totally voluntary, so have a class of 20 students, you might have two or three that volunteer to take the assessment battery. At a y'all sample pool, do, do you guys have a large majority of people that volunteer to go through the assessments? So we don't. We try not to use assessments um, because uh, some people, frankly, are just better at taking tests than others, and that doesn't give you an indication of whether they've got grit or if they've got the skills that are going to enable them to be successful over the long haul. Uh, you know, the 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 what's more valuable to us is looking at that journey of the learner and picking up. Um, other attributes that we can then model on based on what their career trajectory has been, based on what their uh, learning trajectory has been. And so uh, assessments, yes, they, they can be used by all means, and I'm not saying that they're not valuable data points. They are just one of many data points. Um, and uh, I think there's, uh, there's better insight in verifiable data of somebody's experiences, whether that's work or education, uh, that tells us more about the individual and their ability to succeed. And in, in just follow on answer that, you know, we're working at Fort Riley, outside of Fort Riley, in a program called JMCI, where we're trying to help soldiers who are getting ready to depart in the next 12 to 18 months. And we're trying to match them with specific companies. And we've had a challenge there, getting people who want to volunteer and do it. I think part of it is they don't understand um, what it is that, that we're trying to do, what we offer. We've also found that, how do you put it, Chris, the, the, the old ones undervalue themselves and the younger one overvalue themselves. Yeah. Uh, uh, let me just jump to the joint center, the joint center, joint community, what the heck is JMCI? JMCI. It's joint something. <laughs> joint military civilian innovation or something like that. It, it, to, to, to take on the challenge of trying to figure out where to start with this to help Mother Army, um, the first thing you have to understand is if you don't have the data, you don't have squat. We all know that. Um, and and with, I've learned with the data scientists having done with Jim and set with them for hours is the more they have, the better. Okay, so the translation engine has to have enough information for it to actually start to optimize and produce the outcomes that you're looking for. Um, and so the challenge with the Army is if you say the word PII out loud or if you even say any sort of data when it comes to humans out loud, everybody's sphincter slammed shut and you can't breathe in the room anymore, okay? Because nobody nobody wants to go down that rabbit hole. Nobody wants to play that game with JAG and you know it would immediately kill something for about 20 years to get it done. So trying to go to the beginning of the life cycle from cadet command to the academy to direct the sessions uh, for officers, recruiting command, talking to talent management task force. So eventually what happened after two years of this journey was to go, you know, let's go to TAP and let's do this for free. Let's do a private public partnership so it doesn't impact the Army in any way, shape, or form. And let's make it an offer to the soldier to opt in and their family if they wish to do so. And we're at about 500 now after about eight months, um, which means we have enough data now in the machine that sitting with a data, data scientist, Jim and I can point out things like, well, officers and NCOs, OERs have soft skills identified. So let's start with that to get the signal for soft skills. We've gone through every single badge, award, school deployment, uh, PCS assignment, post, and, and tried to call out a series of soft skills associated with those awards. And what do they actually mean? And we've ingested all the narratives from the award specifically for that soldier who received the award. Things that no one else has done before so we can get a really strong soft signal emotional intelligence capability, which is a tremendous skill set in the civilian sector now, that our soldiers, we all know intuitively have it, but there's no way to articulate that to an employer, okay? And what Jim's talking about is, is what we've found is, all of you in this room are old enough that if you got out of the Army today, you will shoot way low because you are so damn selfless that you won't toot your own horn and write your, your, you know, take time to write your resume right and say, look, I am all that in a bag of chips because you are. You'll go out and shoot low and you'll get a job and go, wow, this is really, really simple. I haven't done 
this low of command or leadership since I was a captain. And then next thing you do, you spend the next five years trying to go back up and get where you should have started. This tool tells the older folks, start here. You are that good. But it's also a great tool for the Army because it shows young men and women who are getting out too young who didn't re-enlist and goes, you know what? They think they're going to be uh, an influencer on the Internet and make millions of dollars. Their expectations are way off the chart, unrealistic and high. This tool goes, no, this is really what your trajectory looks like. And these are the upskilling things you need to be more competitive when you decide to get out. You might want to do what your NCOs have been telling you to do for the last two years and get down to the Ed Center, use your tuition assistance, get some education, prepare yourself better to get out. So it's either McDonald's today or it's IBM in three years, she might want to re-enlist. And so we've learned in this process that soldiers who have had assignment officers or detailers or whatever they call them in each of the different branches, they've had somebody telling them, here's where you're at, here's where we think you should go, and here's the pathway to get there through development. And they did that during every stage of my career. And I never questioned it other than maybe once in a while location, okay? When I went to retire, guess what? Crickets. And what happened was my inbox filled up with a thousand options with about 4,000 additional options that led me to another 2 million possibilities. And it overwhelmed me because I had nobody walking me on that journey. No matter what pre post co courses I went to, nobody really walked me on that journey. They told me how to do an interview, how to write a resume and how to wear a suit, which obviously I don't do when I go out. So, this is a digital assignments officer to help these kids transition. That's how I sell it at Riley. This is your new assignments officer. It's going to give you three pathways. Do nothing, and here's what you can do. A little upskilling, here's what you can do. Holy crap, you're not ready to go. You probably should stay, which is what I made an agreement with the Army because I want to help re-enlistment as well. I don't want this to be so damn sexy that people want to leave the Army in droves. I want them to leave informed as best we can get them. So that's what we're doing at JMCI to circumvent and get around the whole PII issue is to get soldiers opt in. And now that they're talking to each other, now that they're seeing a document that they can take with them through TAP or a document that they can take home and show their spouse, they now have a plan and they can make informed decisions. That's our goal. And I must admit, we are here at Army University Home of Access. And so, I mean, it may sound a lot a, a DOD program, but Chris and I's problem with that DOD program is that when Chris put his stuff in, it gave him 177 different possibilities. And most soldiers start to get out, they get 177 possibilities, and they'll get paralysis by analysis. Um, we're trying to help them bring it down to three or four or five, uh, which I think is a more useful path. And it's what I'm finding. And so what we're doing is a little bit different than what the DOD system is. And it's worth, it's worth talking a little bit about the details behind that. You know, we, we talk about measuring the attributes of the individual, and then we use that to map an understanding of what the pathway is for if it's last mile training, reskilling, or upskilling. Uh, and then we, we advance that into a recommendation. And, and, and bear in mind here, we're giving you the choice. We're not telling you exactly how you can career, what your path looks like, what we're saying to you, here are the options that you have, and we can narrow them down based on our understanding of the skills that you've got. How do we measure those, uh, those attributes? Well, mentioned verified skills. You know, or MOS, or And then they work with structured, semi-structured, and we can pull that in, and then we can organize the data they're looking for, and we can actually see what skills you've acquired in your journey uh, through your your military service. We can actually see how they map and where the gaps exist. And it's those gaps that are really, really valuable. That's where we can help you bridge the skills gap. We can tell you what you have today, 
and what you need to be successful and how that translates into those pathways so that we can recommend those choices to you. That's essentially the, the, the translation activities of our engine. Uh, and it scales very well uh, in, and in terms of the architecture around data ingestion and uh, also in terms of how we pull the data in. So we don't really worry too much about the data. What we do worry about is how do we understand how the skills are broken out from the workforce side, how the skills are broken out from the syllabi, and then what are the skills that you've picked up and acquired along the way in terms of your experiences so that we can normalize that and then use our feature space to model it back into those recommendations. For an example of the kind of data that, that Kai is talking about, you know, we've ingested the learning outcomes from every course in the Army University course catalog. So whatever course you took in uniform, those learning outcomes have been fed into the machine and are part of what's being used uh, to do this gap analysis. Uh, yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Jackie Dooling from ARI. I'm working on a similar project. Um, so it's I'm, I'm going to push you into my frame of mind a little bit. But what I'm doing is, is mapping assessments to competencies. And one of the things we first started with as a psychometrician with that back background, um, we're looking at how do you validate these data. I, I think you called them traces. I don't remember. But validate them in the sense of how relevant is what you're grabbing data-wise to the skill you're trying to assess. So to what extent do you, I know you said you kind of don't care about the data, but I know you do. Oh. Um, <laughs> to what extent do you have a good feel for how appropriately these data are representing these, especially the softer skills? Um, how reliable is that data? How fair is it? You know, some people may not have access to some of those data points that may be really important. And, you know, also I want to throw in there, sometimes when, in the past, when we looked at creating measures, it's, I think people refer to it as dust bowl empiricism, where it's, you grab every data point you can and see what predicts, and lo and behold, it's how many times you've moved as a child, which is completely untrainable. So to what extent are those issues stuff you've, you've wrestled with? Over. Great question. Uh, so we, yes, you're right, data is important, but we also recognize that it's very dirty and there's uh, things that you have to do to try and understand what those predictive insights are that can give you value. Uh, so for example, with, with the uh, university program that we've been using, when we work with the universities, we're actually able to get 10 years worth of alumni data and we use that to train our engine and, and get an understanding of the model's effectiveness so that any other learner that comes through for that institution is going to be uh, you know, ultimately compared to that 10-year that history that enables us to make some predictive uh, indications as to what success looks like for somebody who does that program. Now, the other things that we do is we do grab a tremendous amount of exhaust data uh, you know, Chris mentioned PII. Uh, the reality is, is PII is very important to us. We have, uh, you know, SOC 2 compliance. We've got a ton of uh, controls in place to protect the PII that we own and organize. But a lot of you use Facebook. A lot of you use LinkedIn. A lot of you use Glassdoor. And you know what? You've made your information public. And so we do take advantage of that to see how people from those institutions have actually progressed in their journey beyond getting the degree or the certification. And that gives us further insight as to what success looks like for a learner from that institution in the real world. And so we, we try to, we try to uh, be um, very aware of the veracity of our output. Um, but, and we also recognize that uh, there is a certain amount of training data that you need to have to be able to have good predictive insights around your models, which is why we look for the 10 years uh, at a minimum, whether that's working with an institution or with a company for that matter. And we do work with some enterprises and they, they do have HRIS systems and ATS systems, HR, uh, HRIS, uh, Human Resources Information Systems, ATS, Applicant Tracking Systems that give us indications of those individuals and we can track that as well. Uh, so we can tell you what success looks like for you in the company. What are the skills, both hard and soft, that are going to enable you to progress within that company? Or is this actually the right fit for you? So if you're a learner or a soldier coming in to our system uh, and you're looking for that opportunity in that job, part of that is going to be underpinned by the soft skills that we can pick up. And then we can look at that company and say, what soft skills 
predict success for you within that company. We did, we did a very early on, we did a, a insight project for Sprint, now T-Mobile, where we looked at uh, success for their sales force. And one of the things that came out is T-Mobile or Sprint's view of what success was, was actually not correlating with what true success was for the people in their firm. They thought it was these go-getter A-types that you know, demonstrated strong leadership. And these were the people that were successful in sprint and sales. Actually, it was people who were more collaborative, more communicative, people who were not necessarily pushing the agenda that stayed and had success in that role. And these are the kinds of insights that we can pull once we get the signal, and we can use that to uh, help us inform the learner's journey. I, I know, but I, I got to keep talking. Is it okay? <laughs> I'm sorry. I just want to give a quick practical use case you could do that if you did something like what he just said, what they're actually doing today with universities and alumni and whatnot. Imagine if we were able to sit down and take 10 years of battalion command boards, take the battalion command board instructions and ingest that into the engine to learn what we were looking for, and then ingest all of the data of the officers who went before the board who were considered eligible who were competed, and then look at what are they, who did we pick over those 10 years, and then look at 10 years, what they did, how successful were they after that? And, and look at those then and compare them to what the machine would have picked versus what the humans picked. And, and try to determine are our beliefs of bias and our OERs being inconsistent, things written in, you know, all these things we've been trying to answer, we might for the first time be able to analyze and sit down and look at where we make real precise tweaks in the system by doing longitudinal research against things that we have now in data. And you guys have the largest repository of human data on the, what, the face of the earth at ARI? Pretty close? Yeah. I mean, that's what, that's what Dr. Goodwin told me. So, but, uh, but using your data to do this, so you're not violating things with current force, I think would be very valuable to the Army to see, do we have the strategy right? Are we picking the right people? Uh, you know, those are the kinds of things we could learn. But I think, where is the doctor here from the STE? Or the, yeah, your turn. Thank you, sir. Um, I guess my question is on the job requirement side of the coin. Um, so how, how do you address tracking a moving target? Like you're starting to see continual shifts and the types of skills and jobs and roles that people have, especially with automation coming online. So how do you account for that? My favorite question and one of the reasons why I got involved with Astra Mu. Uh, many years ago, I was uh, working for the CEO of Walters Clor on a project looking at capability management and big data. And this was back in 2012, 2013. And one of the things that they asked me to try and understand was what what are the changes that are happening in big data, um, which is what it was called back then. This is kind of before uh, AI became really the, the AI and ML became part of the uh, vocabulary. Um, and then the other piece was what kind of capabilities are starting to emerge in the marketplace. Now, the way you did that analysis back then is you just went through lots of job sites, lots of big tech companies, and you started kind of trawling through spreadsheets to try and figure that out. And one of the things that started to emerge in my mind was uh, this idea of a data scientist. And so, of course, natural curiosity is, well, what's a data scientist? Um, and, and then I began to realize oh, anyone who's a performance analyst, statistics, you know, can work with data at scale, et cetera. And so this idea of a data scientist started to emerge in the job roles. Now, what's interesting is it was five, six years later that the universities and other programs caught up with data science programs. That, that is a delay. Uh, and it's, it is a competitively disadvantageous delay for any, any economy that is trying to be uh, you know, advancing and growing with where companies want to take it. And so the companies have to deal with that capability gap. Where Astra Mu can fit in, because we're actually normalizing the, uh, the understanding of skills, both on the enterprise side and on the institution side, down the road, my belief is that we'll be able to see those changes emerging in job roles because they always change. And we're constantly pulling in job roles, job descriptions, 
we're pulling them in from uh, you know the, uh, the the government websites, we're pulling them in from company websites, etc. And we're using that to understand and inform our skills library and grow our understanding of what that is. We can start to see arguably emerging skills coming into the marketplace. And we can use that as information to go back to universities and institutions and say, here are some emerging skills and your programs are here and they need to be here. You need to make some adjustments so that you can be competitive and be able to continue to deliver adults to support that trend, that trend and that capability need in the workforce. So let me jump on that. So this, that therein lies the problem here at Fort Leavenworth in the people strategy any doctrinal development is that lag and so the we developed the pl place here called the center for army lessons learned and a big part of their mantra evolved over time with tactics techniques and procedures e e emerging doctrine uh, when i was a writer there i was sent to haiti during the invasion of haiti we did an air assault off an aircraft carrier we did all kinds of innovative crazy things and when I came back, one of them was I brought was they came up with uh, graphics for how you do operations in a city. And so they came up with a graphic for a riot. They came up with a graphic for a roadblock. They, graphics that we didn't teach at CGSC. That nobody had a bunch of majors, SAMS graduates, created their own graphics. I brought them back here to the graphic guy who did 101-5-1, I think it was back then, and said, these are new graphics that you need to put in Annex D and we need to get this out because we have, units are still rotating down there. But this is the thing called peacekeeping, peace enforcement, peace enhancement, you know, utwa, mutwa, all its evolutions. We created that at call to be able to keep with the emerging changes. Always focused on training. Very few things taught uh, in terms of captured on education and changing what it is we need to do with the human. The Human Dimension Task Force came online because we weren't doing that and filled that gap for a while. So tools like this, instead of you know personality-driven ad hoc task forces that we stand up to solve these problems, which are huge because it's the human dimension piece of this, have to be created and, and made institutional to support the people strategy that we just watched, to do exactly what you're saying. Otherwise, it's static. And your organizational design that you created five years ago and your strategy that comes to fruition is already 10 years behind. It never maintains pace with your operational design, which is what we try to teach at SAMS. So getting those two in sync and constantly look at them, there's no way that humans can do it in an analog way. And our systems within TRADOC are not responsive or flexible enough to keep up with changing it that fast. And that's what drives the people strategy. So it's that synchronization we have to come to the realization in his line of effort one, which is find technology to help us with this, is what we've got to experiment with and take risk. So Keith, you've got a question, I think, from online. There's a question. Yeah, I'll just say that. Sir, the question was, how do you know, how and when do you know when the AI makes mistakes and when to adjust the algorithms? Uh, another great question. Uh, so the the best way to know if a mistake has been made is to engage the learner. And so what we what we've uh, sort of built out is this idea of the learner app. And the learner app enables us to actually have the learner participate in validating and verifying that information. Now, because we're using verified records anyway, the chances are that from the institutions, whether that's the, 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 the school telling us that these are the, these are the programs that they've taken and here are the grades that they've got uh, versus other verifiable records from employers, we can also have the learner engage and give us feedback. And we also use a number of other uh, machine learning capabilities at scale that help us continually evolve our understanding and to get feedback on what we're looking at in terms of the data and if that is in fact uh, reflecting the consistency that we want to see in our models and our predictions. And so it's constant feedback, it's constant learning and as we grow uh, that gets better and uh, the more feedback we get obviously uh, the better the quality of the data and ultimately the predictive insights in the AI. And we have a whole uh, uh, effort around that in terms of the way our data science team works from ingestion to training the models 
to then validating them before they get deployed, and then how we actually version and manage uh, our understanding of those models over that period of time. And we also track, you know, data lineage, et cetera, so that we can continually stay focused on the quality of the data to support the predictions. And in, specifically in some of the Army stuff, Chris and I work very closely with the data scientists because some of the jargon and things we talk about in the Army, they have no clue. What I mean, translation Army to civilian is, is difficult. And when you get a data scientist who may not even be from the United States, um, it, it's a challenge. And so we get a chance to do help do that interpretation. So yeah. Pete, you had a question a while back. Thanks, sir. Um, the question, you know, just as you were mentioning in terms of the individual, and then you were talking about the institutions, the organization, and, and one of the things on the data ingest that I'd be very interested in is, is, you know, as you're picking up those insights into organization and organizational changes, you know, what kinds of things are you ingesting from, you know, you have the 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 customer who's the individual, but also the customer who's actually the institution. This kind of goes right back to you, sir, uh, John Hughes, in terms of what the Army could benefit out of. You know, every 603 that gets cut on every year by branch tells you what the quality, what we're looking for in a branch, you know, in, a, in an officer serving at grade. But the validity of that over time and what our real challenge is not necessarily what we've done in the past, but what we're going to be doing in the future is where I think we have the biggest challenge. And so I'd be interested in times in terms of like how has if you if you even have the bandwidth in looking at the institutions you have worked with, you know, in colleges or universities in terms of the stability of still syllabi, for example, things that are kind of in there. How is that kind of taken uh, kind of a predictive side? So uh, the the ingestion activities clearly, uh, to be honest, can be haphazard. Uh, as you know, uh, we do work with uh, universities. Uh, their systems of record, uh, so SISs, their student information systems. We also work with other uh, tools that they have that enable us to capture uh, the verified records that come in there. And we also get the syllabi from the institutions. Now, the reason why we put a fair degree of store in that syllabi construct is because there are governing bodies that sort of define the standards of what your program and the syllabi in it should be. And we use that standardization in many ways to sort of in, inform and ultimately drive some of the decisions we make through the models. Uh, that doesn't mean that they're always right. And we can see some inconsistencies, which is one of the reasons why we normalize the data on the institution side so that we can try and isolate those inconsistencies and verify what's actually meant. And then we kind of have a normalized view of syllabi and programs, and that enables us to get more accuracy out of our models. Uh, and there are things like that that we can do in the ingestion side. And, and the, the, uh, in terms of our technology platform, the architecture we use to support a lot of that at scale is Databricks. And uh, so we have, you know, you kind of have the, the bronze layer, which is where the raw data comes in. Then you have that area of processing, pre-processing, et cetera, which is where the data scientists do a large amount of their work in terms of model development. Uh, and then finally, when we've proven the models, we feel that they're ready to be deployed so that we can learn and get some more feedback on it. We'll move that into our gold layer, which is the production ready stuff. Sir. Good afternoon, gentlemen. I'm Captain Terry. I'm with the Vice Provost of Academic Affairs Office uh, here on the installation. And I'm actually a National Guard soldier that's here um, in my uh, on a Title X order. And I actually come from higher education, including some of the schools that are on that list um, in the pilot with Astro U several years ago through Casey <laughs> Scholars and look at about, I think, 18 community colleges and local colleges here in the area and utilizing that data to create that algorithm to be able to provide students with the, you know, a short list of what matches with their major. And, and actually, uh, General Hughes and I met back in 2015 over at the um, uh, World War II um, Memorial uh, with Major General, or I'm sorry, General Danner talking about this very thing and how do we make sure that we're helping <coughs> our, our students um, grow into the right majors. So Mike, so with that and excited about this opportunity, and thank you for your time. My question is, is that as Astrum U um, utilizes that artificial intelligence to identify what a student's best fit might be, and they 
narrow that down to maybe three choices and they want to um, that student wants to make the most money for example right in their career how does that equate for things like um, um, maybe being a teacher or being an artist or being a musician or uh, because when I when I think about how the AI provides for me what my best fit would be to make the most potential money to be able to support family or whatnot is there a possibility that the AI leaves out some things, some aptitudes, for example, that maybe would help find us really good educators? Maybe they're not going to make a lot of money, so they're not going to pick that major because AstroMU provides them that report and says, look, you can make, you know, in this year and your UMAC or these parameters, but it might leave out some of those hundred and the general had when he got out of the science things like that. I think uh, an excellent question and, and the the thing that we always like to say at Astrum U is our CEO is a uh, English lit major with a minor in German and now he's running an AI company uh, so it kind of talks to the fact that you have uh, people who have those creative skills people who come from shall we say the right side of the brain there are so many opportunities that they can participate in uh, in terms of the careers. What Astrum U is trying to do is open up what those opportunities are. Um, so people, you know, today, emerging roles coming into the market is game design. It's a huge market potential. Tons of uh, companies are trying to hire people who can design games. And, uh, and you need more of a creative person there, people who traditionally choose graphic uh, design. Uh, versus looking at game design where actually the skills they have for graphic design are just as applicable. Or people in music, because in game design they have a lot of background music and they have a lot of sounds that they need to attribute to the moves that you make within that game. Why would you not surface those opportunities for them as well? And I think it kind of addresses the question if, if they are looking to try and maximize the return on their education, uh, then there are other opportunities that are open to the creative skills and the creative talents because not everybody is going to be the winner of American Idol. But they are potentially going to be very successful in other creative pursuits and opportunities that exist in the marketplace if those are surfaced in a way that enables them to see those dots. I think what's important to understand, and I've, I've watched some soldiers do this at Riley now, it's the criteria isn't best paid job when it says you're going to be most successful, what it's telling you is the degree of probability for you to be successful in this. Okay. So it could be music. It could be art. It could be teaching. Okay. If you don't like those options, you go down below and say, I would really like to be a rocket scientist. And then it comes back and goes, well, based on what we know about you today, here's the 97 year journey. It's going to take for you to get there, Chris, because you're not, they're not even remotely qualified for this. Or, hey, that's a good idea, too. With this tweak and tweak, you could, you could pursue that with a relatively high degree of success if you pursued that. So it isn't you're going to get the highest paying job. There was a, um, a, a major over at Riley, and um, she was in the medical service prof profession, and she, I think she was a cl clinician. And she said, I, I joined the Army because my husband was in the Army. I made major. It's been really cool. I don't want to have anything to do with that. That's what everybody wants to hire me when I get out of the army. They want to hire me to do what I did in the army. I'm getting out of the army because I don't want to do that anymore. You know, I want to be an X, and I won't tell you what it was because it was pretty specific. So we'll type it in, and then it showed her how to get there. You know, and again, it, it, some people it's simple, some people it's intuitive, some people it is, it, it it's a reality check. It's to make the informed decision, and and our younger soldiers don't want to hear you got yeah, got to go to college because that's too broad. What they want to see is, oh, if you go to college and then we actually work with institutions that use our tool to see how good soldiers are so you don't have to pay for four years of college. You come to our school, you only have to do two because we know this about you before you even start. Then the tool gives them even more granularity. They go, oh, we'll get rid of this class and this class and we can get you out of here in a year and a half. That way they don't have that false illusion. They got to spend four to six years in college and they get out of the army to get a good job. And, and just quick, um, not only do we use the verified data, but we also use their desires, what what they want, their interests. 
So that is also factored into the algorithm uh, or the location where they want to go. You know, one of my problems with SkillBridge was always when you went through there and you hit SkillBridge, it gave you all 1,200 of the internships where AI could very simply sort for you based on the location you were interested in or some other parameter. But it's not the way it was set up, at least the last time I went in. And I think that's the key. We, we leave it to a choice and, and we, we make a recommendation, we, we rank them and we sort of leave the choice up to you. And if that's not the recommendation that you like, you can go back in and change those parameters. Thank you. Thank you. Sir? Um, I, I have a couple of questions I'm trying to formulate and all. This, this is in the realm of the data analysis piece. Uh, digital education, so that's my focus and I'm trying to extrapolate. I'm excited about what you're talking about, but I'm trying to extrapolate out and say, I, I want to use this somehow. Uh, there is a tendency for us to pursue the shiny uh, as it relates to education, right? Gamification, this is a new way to deliver. Has the data or have you, is there an opportunity to look at the data to reverse back and say, look, we've looked at all of these folks uh, and predicted the success uh, once they get out of their career path progression or what they're going to do. Uh, we've looked at the courses that they've taken and the skill sets that are related to those courses uh, and the successes uh, and the way those courses were delivered. And so now we can say, look, we believe that uh, developing these types of digital education for the Army uh, in this way yields better success out here for not just military uh, success, career path progression, but also when they get out. This is the area, this is the narrowing of the focus of where we need to pursue digital education. Uh, so not, so we're not always chasing after the shiny course development and this, that, and we've got multiple people trying to do 50 million things that there's, hey, stay in this lane, we've had the best success here uh, because the data shows us that not only folks who attend these courses, that they're successful in their careers, but they're also successful when they get out. Does the data support that kind of analysis or discussion? Over. Uh, in time, yes, I believe so. So, but to your point, we're not chasing a shiny object here. We're not trying to boil the ocean. We've established a beachhead. Our beachhead, we started, no, 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 but your point is well Very taken. Hard. And so, and, and we're taking that approach. Look, there's a lot of people that will go out there and tell you AI is gonna solve everything in the world. I, I, I'm, I'm the first person to tell you, it uh, depends on the use case. Um, and, and you've gotta be pragmatic about it. And so we've been very, very thoughtful in terms of our approach. That's why we did Ready, Set. Ready, Set was a very good way to demonstrate how a learner can make a choice about what program they want because it will, it will meet uh, a use case around the role location, salary, uh, in terms of, uh, of, of what that program can meet for them and, and closing that uh, skills gap bridge. We're doing the same here with skill set. Skill set, we're saying, what skills do you have today? What skills do you need so we can close that skills gap bridge for that role or that economic advancement? And, and we're narrowing it so that initially we're going to, and so with JMCI, we're working with Wiley. Wiley has program content. We're working with uh, the veterans who are looking at what their, what their possibilities are outside of the force. And we're working with companies like T-Mobile. And we're essentially creating a use case around, here's the skills that you have that we've been able to translate. Here are the skills that you would require for this role with T-Mobile. And by the way, here's the last mile training that we can offer you through Wiley to close that gap. And that's a very straightforward use case that we can demonstrate our engine's ability to succeed. And we'll grow with that and we'll be, that's our beachhead. And from that beachhead, we can move into other areas and other opportunities to demonstrate use cases like yours, where we can go to a school and say, well, what, is, what, does, what is the last five years or 10 years of alumni for your digital program actually resulted in based on the data that we can see outside and beyond that? And then we can use that to further inform and further refine based on what are the emerging trends in the marketplace to support uh, that learner's success through the program that you're offering. 
And that's a very simple use case and actually models really, really well for AI. But I'm not going to boil the ocean. <laughs> See, and, and, and I keep bugging you because uh, anybody who's spent time around me in the college, you know, I was kind of the assessment geek. I, I want to know how do we know students are learning? And somebody asked a question yesterday about using AI in the assessment world. And I'm convinced we can. Kai just tells me, well, hold on, we got to solve some other problems first and, and then. But I mean, we, we firmly believe that you can pull uh, verifiable social skill, uh, soft skills out of learning outcomes. And, and, and to add on to that, today, most solutions are just matching programs. Indeed, matching, glass door, matching. That's why you get so many opportunities presented to you and you get information overload. And to me, that's, a, that's not a good use case for helping people succeed in their choices. A good use case is where I can come back to them on a very uh, kind of focused area and say, here's how you're going to be successful in this role. And this is what you need to do that. If I might, uh, we've run out of time for the formal part of this, but we're going into the lunch break. And uh, if this gentleman are going to stick around for that part of it, then you'll have the opportunity to uh, uh, ask more questions and, and discuss it further. Thank you. Very interesting. Okay. I, I will note that there are uh, there are uh, 15 more slides, uh, which which talks to some of the things that you ask questions about. So, you know, I welcome you to take a look at those and. Uh, and give us a holler if you have further questions. Absolutely. And, they, and it breaks out exactly how we break the skills across the learner and the jobs, et cetera. So you can see the, the pathway to that. Thank you. Anything not to show PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see if I can get out of this chair. It's the standing up.